You're listening to another episode of the Coast of 101 podcast. I'm Andrew Stowell in North Carolina, and after several weeks of interviews in and out of the industry, I am actually joined by some fellow members of the Coaster 101 team this week. We're going to welcome to the podcast John Stevenson. John, how's it going? Hello, it's going great. Good to be back. Absolutely. And we've got uh, Kyle Lindner. Kyle, how are you? Good. How are you doing, Andrew? Hanging in there. And last but certainly not least, we've got Nick Weisenberger. Nick, how are you? Hey, hey, pretty good. Good to talk to you guys again. Absolutely. It has been a while on the podcast, but you know, the good news is now that parks are starting to open, depending on where you are in the country, you guys have all have one thing in common and that you have all visited Dollywood early this season. I know, Kyle, you went early March. John, you were there in mid-March. And Nick, you just got back within the last week. So I guess, I'll, Kyle, I'll start with you because you were there first. I mean, what are just some some real quick thoughts? I mean, had you been to a park when was the last time you were at a park? Was it Dollywood last year? Well, last year I was at Dollywood for Passholder Day, the day before they closed the park for two months. And then luckily I got to go to Kennywood and Hershey Park as well last year. So I had a little bit of a fix, but getting back again was great. Got it. And uh, John, you're the, uh, the the resident Dollywood regular. Um, what did it? How was it t- for you to get back to the park this year? It was great. It was um, my last visit had been in November. Um, I went in June. I was actually there the day that the park reopened, which was very exciting, a little anxiety uh, filled, but but was great. And then went back for um, uh, winter warm up um, ACES event in November, which was great. So I got to see the uh, Christmas lights and and all of that. So it was definitely good to be back uh, this this year in 2021, um, still a very different experience, you know, different theme park experience just for every park that's reopening. A lot of the safety protocols are still in place, but um, park was a, was a really fun day. Got it. And b- before we get yelled at by people at Ace, that was, was that Smoky Mountain Coaster Fest? I feel like winter warm up didn't happen this year. Yeah, Smoky to- Mountain Coaster Fest. That's actually the first thing that I was going to say. I get the, I always get uh, Smoky Mountain Coaster Fest and Thrills in the Hills, which is Dollywood's coaster event, um, which typically takes place in July. Um, I should know that after having attended both multiple times, but here we are. It's all good. We don't need the uh, we don't need to like fire up the internet with just we don't the we we don't want a cease and desist letter. That is not we, we don't. <laughs> and then um, Nick, you were there. You had a. Um, kind of a family vacation to the Smokies and Dollywood was on your agenda a couple of times, but, uh, how was your, how was your trip? Um, pretty good. Yeah. If you listened to the past episodes of the podcast, you'll know that we visited in last October and we certainly weren't planning on visiting this soon again. Uh, but we didn't have any plans for spring break and everything just kind of aligned perfectly. So we decided to uh, head back down there and yeah, we went to, uh, we stayed in the, uh, Dollywood cabins again. Uh, split a cabin with my parents and so one of the perks of staying in the cabin is you can get a length of stay tickets uh, so we were able to go for a couple hours over three different days uh, last week nice well there's uh obviously you know for coaster enthusiasts there's been two kind of major we'll call them changes there's, there's they're minor changes but they are changes um obviously the first being the rmc of the rmc um lightning rod getting some steel track and getting some new track work and then also uh mystery mine received some track work in the off season from verse lauer john i'll start with you again as someone who is kind of a um seasoned lightning rod veteran um i think you've ridden it more than anybody what did you think of the new track and how was it different how was it a different experience well, I'm happy to report that it is really, um, I, there weren't any super noticeable differences. Um, it was definitely a smoother ride in parts. Um, of course, it still has some of its original wooden track, but uh, or RMC's topper track, uh, which I know is a controversial subject all on its own. But um, the, the steel track, the I-Box track, was installed in some of the more high-stressed uh, sections of the ride. So, um, over the last five years, there definitely had become a few uh, rough spots um, along the, the course of the 
of the ride. And so those were definitely smoother, but it still retained that kind of um, uh, rough wooden coaster like ride experience, which I really liked. It wasn't like you were riding a B&M coaster. It wasn't necessarily glass smooth. And that's not what I really expect or want with um, a wooden now hybrid roller coaster. So it was great. The launch was um, just as fast. I know there's a lot of um, debate over whether or not the launch has been slowed. Uh, it, to me, seems just as fast as it was um, in June of 2016 when I first wrote it. Um, I will say that the launch does seem to turn off. I know Nick can ho- hopefully Nick can make that sound a little bit more technical than uh, than what I'm saying, but it, it does start to slow earlier than it did when it, you know, when it first opened, but as far the launch is still very exhilarating. And then my favorite part of the coaster, the, the quad down, the four consecutive drops is still just as intense and as forceful as it, um, as it was. And that's one of my favorite coaster elements of all time. And so it was, was really great to, um, to, to see that was, was still there. Um, one of the things though, that really surprised me was the, the roar of the trains as they crest the hill, the, the hillside and come back to the, um, exit the quadruple down and then enter in the non-inverting half loop, the, just a very loud roar that I would equate to a B&M or, um, a, yeah, a B&M roar. And so it was very interesting to hear it coming from an from an RMC. I've ridden several RMC hybrids and I just don't recall that sound. Um, so overall, very impressed. Um, still only, it was up and down the day that I was there. Granted it was storming off and on all day, but, um, it still only seems to be running one train, um, uh, reliably. So the lines were a little bit longer, but um, it, it's an amazing coaster and it's, I think, well worth the wait. And Kyle, you, you mentioned you were there on the, the pass holder preview day, which was kind of the, the first taste of every Dollywood season pass holder who had, you know, not been able to visit the park for a couple of weeks or months, however long the time is time's a flat circle. Anyway, how was, uh, how was your experience with lightning rod? I mean, I've, did it, I feel like it opened late in the day when you were there. Um, but how was, um, how was your experience? Yeah. Lightning rod was down when we got there around noon and it didn't open until around four. And by the time I got over there and it was open, it was already a two hour wait, two hour plus. But luckily my buddy Bob was there and he gave me a fast lane pass and I was able to get on in about 20 minutes. It helps to, uh, Helps to know people in all the right places, right? Yeah. So that was great. Um, that was one train ops, which was it was really slow. They seemed like they were getting the train through uh, relatively slow as well. And But the 20-minute wait helped a lot. Um, I'm glad John got to talk first about how much he loves Lightning Rod because um, last year and this year, I just it never lived up to my expectations. <laughs> and not that it's a bad ride, like it's a really good ride, uh, world class ride. But like the other than the quadruple down, I feel like the whole first half of the ride just it seemed very rough and very short. So just the pacing seemed off to me. Um, I actually thought the launch seemed a little faster than usual um, from last year, uh, but that, like John said, it kind of just stops at the top and leaves you hanging wants you you really want to get over that going fast and you can't but maybe that would change my opinion <laughs> gotcha yeah if you guys if anybody listening has been following our website for the last month or so uh kyle tried to light the internet on fire by writing an article that's like it, that was his opinion that thunderhead at dollywood was better than lightning rod and i know john you know threatened to fire you and all that other stuff because of how much he loves lightning rod but um if you're listening and you haven't read that go check that out just search lightning rod and thunderhead on the website um it'll pop up you'll see it um but nick uh when you visited dollywood last fall uh you got 
the unfortunate notice that lightning rod had already closed for the season. And, yep. you know, I know during your three days, you're, you're in and out of the park over three days. Uh, you only got to experience lightning rod one time, but it was your first time on it. So as a first time rider, what do you think? Um, I guess the one word that I would probably use is anticlimactic. So I guess I'd probably lean a little more towards Kyle's opinion than John's. Thanks, but, Nick. <laughs> but yeah, so we were we had length of stay tickets. So we went to the park for a couple hours over three different days. We had time savers, and I still only got on it one time. And like another time that we were in line, uh, it shut down, and a couple guys, maintenance guys, were out climbing the the launch lift hill. Got it. But yes, it's because I mean, like Kyle said, it's it's a great ride. Like there's not like too much you can complain about the actual ride, but I, if I had to rank all my coasters, I wouldn't put it in the top five or even like the top tier. And I think that's a little bit to do with just the fact that like it's been five years of like anticipation of everyone saying like, oh, it's, you know, one of the best coasters in America or the world. And then the, add that to the frustration of, you know, thinking I was finally going to get on it last year and then it being closed. And just all this build up. So when I finally got on it, it was more just like relief than anything. And then I was like, it's a good ride, but uh, not my favorite. Yeah, I'm, I'm watching you guys in the uh, the video that we've got kind of going concurrently with this this recording. And I'm watching the vein on John's forehead just like pop out of head right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm <laughs> clutching my pearls. I just cannot believe what I'm hearing. I mean, I will say my first ride on... Um, on lightning rod back in June of 2016, I, it was the same. I mean, I had, I had made trips to the park, um, in the weeks leading up to that, just because it was, I think Memorial day weekend was when it was finally, there were, um, riders seen on it. And that, that first ride, that one ride, it is, it was very overwhelming. There was a lot to take in. I wasn't really sure what I thought of it after I was kind of just in shock almost of finally having having finally gotten on it because it was supposed to open in March of that year. So I do think it's a ride and I don't know, Kyle, obviously this might not apply to you, but I think it is a ride that you have to, um, you know, really ride a few times to fully appreciate. Nick, what um, what road did you uh, ride in? Uh, I got a front seat ride. Yeah. So, I, yeah I, I, def- I definitely would like to have been that, had the opportunity to ride in different rows and Try on different seats. Yeah. Would have been nice. And it's one of those rides too. I mean, like so many, it, it can vary pretty wildly based on the, you know, external factors like the temperature, the, you know, how yeah, long it's it, been. Yeah. It was very, it was cold when we were down there. So that yeah, may have, that may have negatively affected it too. Well, speaking of the elements, John, I want to talk to you because you had a uh, a first time experience on Lightning Rod, and it you know it didn't involve you spitting on the roller coaster. But I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> another another story for another episode, my friend. <laughs> but you did you did get a uh, a rollback. I did, yes. After so many you know countless rides on Lightning Rod, I finally got one of the coveted rollbacks, and so. Uh, like I said, it had been storming off and on, so the ride was up and down, and it had started raining, which riding lightning rod in the rain, like many roller coasters, is not ideal, but with lightning rod, if you have a chance to get on it, you get on it regardless of what the elements are doing, because you never know. You can't necessarily wait for the rain to clear, because it might not be open when the rain does clear, so... Um, I'd ridden it once and was, was riding it again. And it just, it actually just reopened. I think we were the second train out after it had reopened from a rain, um, lightning delay. And, um, yeah, it went, it, you know, exited the station, launch normal speed. And, um, once I watched consecutive trains, uh, subsequent trains run when they were trying to reopen it. Um, it didn't quite make it up the launch hill as far as it seemed like it did when I was on it, but yeah, it just slowed and came, you know, came to a, a crawl and then just slowly, um, reversed and returned to the bottom of the hill where the train stopped and then they came and, you know, un, uh, uh, released the restraints and we got a little walk back to the station in the rain. <laughs> so did you get to ride again after it or was it down? 
you know, temporarily when they, how does that work at Dollywood? Yeah. So this was about at six thirty, and the park was closing at seven. And at first one of the ride ops or host, um, told us, you know, to, to stick around. And then once maintenance came out, they were there for a little while and then they just shut it down completely. So, um, yeah, still, still having some issues, but, um, it seems like I've been following it on the Dollywood wait times website and seems to maybe be doing a little bit better, but I do think some of the issues on the day of my visit were, I really think were influenced by the, by the rain. Got it. And I know a, another common factor in all three of your visits and, you know, Kyle, you were there first, so I'll start with you. Um, one train operations, obviously never something anybody wants to hear, especially at a park's most popular roller coaster. How are the operations and how were capacity? Were they, were they boarding every row? Were they boarding every other row? Kind of what were they, what were the operations like for lightning rod? Um, if I remember correctly, they were boarding every row. Um, but it just seemed to be really slow, um, getting people on and off. I'm not sure if that was just because it had been down half the day or if it was just their first day open in two and a half months getting back in the swing of things. But I was really surprised. Um, it seemed there really didn't seem to be any rhyme or reason, but it seemed like they were leaving seats or rows open um, it's kind of towards the middle of the train. Um, but it was sporadic. It wasn't every train and obviously it's the same train. So it's not like one train is having issues. So couldn't really figure out what, what that was, what that was about, but it's definitely, you know, when you're running one train, one twenty four seat train, you really need every seat filled. So obviously single riders aren't a thing right now with COVID, but, um, yeah, I was really, really surprised to, to see that. Yeah, and to me, the biggest issue with the one train operation is the amount of time it takes for the train to get from the end of that first magnetic brake run to being parked in the station is longer than the actual ride itself. Like the, it is. the ride was designed to run with two trains, but it's it's still running that way, even though it's only running with one train. Like if, if it takes forever for one train to crawl from the brake run to the station that's fine if you're running two trains but with only one train that's the thing that makes the line so long so it's like they really need to just like change some of those those last set of magnets on the the first brake run to have actuators or or something so they can like turn those brakes off so you can keep the train rolling and get it back to the station faster that would help like immensely and then one train operation would be fine but it's that crawling from the brake run back to the station is the part that takes forever and then the lines, like the line move, just moves in chunks. So then it, that's like, that's even worse than a slowly moving line. And yeah, that's, that's like the one thing they need to fix the most to me. That's spoken like a true engineer who also <laughs> happens to be a theme park fan. I love it. Well, and I will say that they're, they're doing great with, uh, they had a ride host, um, right before you get to the, the platform and they were assigning seats. So there was, they did have that efficiency in place. Um, so that definitely helped, but yeah, it, it is a crawl back to the, to the station. So that definitely does not help. Got it. Well, let's, let's, um, let's move on. We're, I know we can talk, John, especially we can talk about <laughs> lightning rod for an entire hour here, but there are other things to talk about at Dollywood. Um, another coaster at Dollywood that received some, minor to major off-season renovations and track work uh, was Mystery Mine. And again, I visited Dollywood one time and it was like seven years ago. I don't remember very much about my one ride on Mystery Mine, but one of you guys, and I don't, somebody volunteer, what was the main change and how did it affect the ride? So the main change really is the first outdoor section. So after you leave the mine, you have the first vertical lift and it crosses that trestle that um, crosses over the Timber Canyon area path midway. Um, And then originally you would exit that trestle bridge and there would be a vertical dive straight, straight from that. And then you would enter a U-turn and then a, a helix other helix and then go, you know, go back into the mine building for the, for the main drop. So now instead of, um, of diving vertically off of the trestle bridge, 
you make a 90 degree turn to the left. There's a still steep drop, not as, not as steep, not as, uh, uh, I guess tall, maybe it's probably roughly about the same height, maybe a little shorter. And then you, instead of, you know, it's the, the U-turn is no longer a component of the ride, but it, they've let, they've kept it there. Um, it kind of as a, decoration i guess um it it is a little disorienting because especially if you've ridden it a lot you still think it's like oh wow where you know is the train somehow going to jump the track and it was interesting hearing people while i was riding it just being very confused about that track still being there so um aside from that drop it's it's mostly the same but it it was a that's the the biggest change really kyle how do you how do you think it affected the ride uh, I didn't get on it. It oh. wasn't open yet. Well, then that's a great answer. Um, Nick, <laughs> how do you think it affected the ride? So I did uh, get on it. So as I said in the, I sat in the front row on the far right hand side. And um, so I, honestly, I don't even, I, I don't remember what the old drop in turn really felt like that much. I just remember like always feeling like I had to brace myself right when you got to that drop. Uh, but the new one I thought was great. It was fast. It was smooth. It was fun. Like I thought it was an improvement and, and I didn't notice that the ride was any shorter. Although um, the guy who was sitting next to me, he did make a comment that I heard him say like, oh, another break run already. So like, I guess he noticed it was <laughs> shorter, but to me, it was, it was great. I thought it was a good improvement. Nerds. Typical yeah. Nerds just <laughs> ru- ru- ruining everything on a coaster ride. <laughs> I, I thought it was an improvement too. I was very skeptical just because, and, he, and I, I'm right there with you, Nick. You kind of did have to brace yourself for that, um, that the original drop, um, the U-turn as well. So it is a little bit smoother. I like that the drop is facing the the midway, so that you can. It's easier to see people as a drop. And I was really surprised. There's a, a bit of a pop of airtime off of the drop, which I was really yeah. surprised by. Um, yeah, and there, too. yeah, there, are, there, there's some little trims there on the drop that someone pointed out. I didn't notice if they were being used. It, it was, you know, very, very subtle. Yeah, I was just wondering because I think the first construction pictures we saw the new track, there weren't any trims, but then I think since when it opened, they added them, but they don't seem to have any negative effect or anything like that. Well, that, take it from. Uh two coaster enthusiasts who wrote it that it's not that much different and uh still a pretty good ride overall i know they had some uh issues last year with some theming that fell off the ride or something like that i is that piece of track and again i'm not super familiar with the layout but is that piece of track kind of still exposed or is has anything been done in that regard well the um the trestle bridge that crosses the midway, that is where a part of the theming fell um, last year, or the year before. Um, and it's still, they've, they've stripped all of that, that um, kind of that wooden support, wooden beam um, theming off of it. And so it still looks a little bare. I'm hoping that they'll reintroduce that, um, that theming to to the bridge just makes it look a little bit more realistic. Um, but as far as the U-turn, from what I can tell, the way that the track was cut and um, just that, you know, obviously the ride is operating now. So I'm thinking that they're going to leave that that track there. I mean, and it does look cool. I think it's it's a clever way to, you know, save some money, not having to, to you know, take it down. And then it still just it looks cool still being there well i know we're not we're moving into the the time where you don't really want to talk about COVID anymore but i mean as far as visiting the park last year which all three of you did how had the you know COVID protocols and the mask in, enforcement and compliance i mean what did you guys see at the park and kyle i'll start with you i mean is it has it evolved at all over time obviously i know you know, the science behind COVID is evolving, but is, I've seen, heard rumors that, you know, COVID doesn't exist in Pigeon Forge, if you ask anybody there, but um, how was the enforcement and the um, safety protocols at Dollywood? 
So like I said, it, um, last year I was there same time on Passholder Day, and that was kind of the week everything was going down across the country. Mm-hmm. And there was no mask mandates or anything yet, but Dollywood had like worked overnight to put, you know, hundreds of hand sanitizing stations across the park. And that's the only time I visited last year. So um, looking f- from that to this year, I, I don't recall seeing those hand sanitizing stations everywhere. I could just be, you know, that's just what you t- think you're going to see. So you don't see them everywhere. It's just normal now. But other than that, the operations seem to be very similar to what we experienced last year at Hershey Park in Kings Island, where, you know, every half hour, hour or so, everything's shut down and they, they're, you know, sanitizing the trains down with their air sprayers and such. Um, other than that, it just seemed to be like more of the same of what we've seen. Okay. Nick, what about you? Same kind of the same deal? Yeah. I think the, the biggest thing I noticed is they changed the, procedure on the train so when we visited last year they were only loading every third row of the train the dollywood express uh which would like severely cut off the the capacity and so they um had started giving out uh, reservation tickets like you had to get a ticket for a certain time to come back to so this year they're now loading every single row of the train and they've put up a plastic plastic dividers on every row so they can do that so now you don't need a, a ticket anymore so that was probably the, the biggest change. And uh, it seems like they're loading every row on the, the coaster trains now where they maybe weren't last year. And also, I'm, I'm not sure about, uh, well, I guess the one thing is, I'm not sure, is, it seems like maybe they have increased the capacity of the park as well. Yeah. We, we, were, we were there on the Saturday before Easter for a few hours before we left, and it seemed to be very crowded. The parking lot seemed to be at least 80% full. Yeah, my experience, I think, was really influenced because I was there on a Saturday, the 27th, I think, and that's like peak spring break season for the area. And um, so it was really, I think, influenced by the storms. The weather kept the park pretty, pretty thinned out. I was really impressed by, I mean, the mask compliance, it's hit or miss. I mean, it's a theme park. It's just, you know, it you can only be so many places at once, but I was really impressed by, um, by the ride, ride ops, the host uh, at making sure people, especially on the rides were keeping their mask on. And I think that's important now that they are increasing capacity, capacity of the trains they are not boarding every other row on all the rides. Um, so that was, I was really glad to see that. Um, thankfully Dollywood's big enough that I, it's, especially outside it's it's definitely doable to keep your distance um so i didn't see any security or anyone enforcing the mass mandates out in the park but um, i do have to give a shout out to dollywood whoever uh is purchasing their hand sanitizer because of all the hand sanitizer i used at theme parks last year which was a lot dollywood <laughs> by far has the best like because they will give they they are very um strict and that when you get on a ride you have to use hand sanitizer they will squirt it for you but on almost all the roller coasters like you sanitize your hands or you're not getting on so it is i don't know what brand it is i have never used it before outside of dollywood that type but if someone from dollywood can let us know i will gladly buy a jug of it for my personal collection so dollywood if you're listening uh, gallons of uh, Purell. Attention, John Stevenson, and it is, just DM it us, is not DM Purell for the address. It is okay. not Purell, and I will <laughs> die on that hill. Nope. <laughs> okay. Last Dollywood thing I want to talk about, and Nick, you added this to the rundown because I think you saw it during your uh, most res- recent visit. Was the Chasing Rainbows hologram, which is kind of this hologram mus- musion effect of Dolly Parton that is located. Somewhere in the park, I am again not familiar. Nick, please tell us everything you know about that. Yeah, so it's kind of in that the section of the park, um, right before you get to Lightning Rod. But yeah, since we had just gone to Dollywood before, this time we decided let like let's try to do a couple things we hadn't done before. Uh, one of them was like the the Rock and Roadway car ride next to Lightning Rod. Uh, did that with the kids once Lightning Rod was closed, <laughs> and then so then the other thing we did was the Chasing Rainbows Museum. 
which is full of a bunch of um, like artifacts and personal belongings and stuff from uh, Dolly from her childhood. Um, so the first thing you do when you go in, it's, it's kind of weird. And they are limiting the, the amount of people who can be in the building. So that's there was a bit of a line, actually, like a 10-minute wait to get in. But the first thing you do when you go in is there's just like cinder block walls with picture frames on them. Like you're going into like a high school or something. It's really bizarre. But then you go upstairs into a room that's like, I think it's called Dolly's Attic. And yeah, and there's this really cool, uh, I think it's Musion Eyeliner, like 3D hologram effect. It looks really cool. And yeah, my, my kids were freaked out by it because they were like, it looks real, but we know there's something off about it, but we can't figure out what it is. <laughs> <laughs> so that was pretty funny to see the reaction to that. But, but yeah, that was pretty cool. Can I just say that I've been going to Dollywood since 2001, and I am ashamed to say that my visit in March was my first time inside Chasing Rainbows, and I'm a huge Dollywood fan. I think she is a national treasure and should be protected at all costs, and I went in there and was just because it was raining off and on. So, you know, the things that we could do were limited and it actually just reopened it. it I don't believe it was open at all last year due to COVID. And I just walked in in, in amazement and thinking, why have I not been in here every time I've been to the park? I mean, it is if you have the chance to go. I mean, really, you could spend a lot of time in there, but it's definitely worth just taking a, a, a walk through and looking. And yeah, the hologram was um, I could see how that would be a little unnerving just because it, it, it's such a different you know it's not like it's it's not a video screen it's not like a tv with dolly on it it's it's very much uh she's there she's there with you uh question for you guys do you have any you know again a couple of seasoned dollywood veterans here do you have any uh if you had one tip that you could give our audience about visiting dollywood um what would you what would you tell them, John? I'll start with you. Um, if you're going this season and have not written have not ridden lightning rod before, two pieces of advice: first, get there as early as you can, go straight to the ride, wait in line even if it's you know not open or is delayed. Second of all, especially during these times with the one train operations, if you if it's um, feasible and works in your budget, highly recommend a time saver. New this year, you're able. Historically, you, um, the time saver, let's just say you would get 10 um, skip the line passes per time saver. You were only able to use lightning rod, uh, use it on lightning rod up to two times. New this year, you can use Alton, however many spots, um, skip the line passes on lightning rod. So with the one train operations, even the, the time saver line, it gets pretty long. But um, if, if this is your like one day at Dollywood, Highly, highly recommend the the investment in Time Saver and cinnamon bread. Just cinnamon <laughs> bread. That, that's a strong recommendation any at any time. I mean, not just Dollywood. Apparently, there are other part. You know, Silver Dollar City's got cinnamon bread, and rumor has it our our friends over at Kentucky Kingdom. Now that they're under the uh, Hershey umbrella, they're going to get some cinnamon bread. So it's going national, and we'd love to see cinnamon bread going national. Uh, Kyle, what about you? What's a uh, tip you would give a uh, person about Dollywood? Thunderhead, Thunderhead, Thunderhead. Hey, the last uh, three seasons, it's gone through um, some track. Um, I don't know what you call it. Re retracking. track, re retracking. There, that's good. So every year it's gotten better, and this year it just it seems like a brand new ride, like just opened. Um, if you're a first time visitor to the park, you could, they could trick you into thinking that was a brand new ride, uh, compared to other wooden coasters. It's probably the smoothest one out there right now. And it just from start to finish, it's relentless. And I just love every aspect of it. So I highly recommend taking the time to go hike back to Thunderhead because, uh, it always has less than a 10 minute wait as well. Even when the park was at 80% capacity, I got on, you know, five times in a half an hour. And that's a great way to end the day for sure. So to reiterate, uh, there's an article on the website of why Kyle thinks Thunderhead is more of a lightning rod. <laughs> be sure to go check that out. Nick, uh, what is your tip? Um, my tip would be if you're going to be down there uh, for a week, like on vacation, like we were, if you have, a couple different days to choose from to go to Dollywood. 
Um, I would look at the weather forecast and I would actually choose the day that has the worst weather forecast and go on that day. So on we, last week when we were there on Wednesday, it rained most of the morning and that had like by far the worst weather forecast of that week. The park was only open till six. We didn't get there till four, but the park was empty. So like that was lightning rod was basically a walk on. Um, we pretty much rode more that day than the other two days combined. Um, so that's that's the biggest regret I have of the trip is we didn't get there earlier on Wednesday because we could, I could have rode lightning rod more times. Uh, if there were operations for fast ride, I could have rode it more times. But we could have done a lot more stuff if we had put more time into it um, on the day that had the worst weather. So when we went back on Friday and Saturday, it was sunny and no chance of rain. And the park was way, way more crowded. So are you blaming your kids or your wife for not getting there on time? I'm, I'm blaming my daughter Don't because she question. was she was napping. <laughs> she was napping on Wednesday. I'm like, okay, like, good, wake good up safe. so we could go. You know, she fortunately I don't think is quite at the age where she listens to podcasts, and so if she ever comes to the back catalog, she's gonna be really mad. But one day she's like, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well. I know when you guys also uh, visited the greater Pigeon Forge Gatlinburg area, um, you spent some time in a couple of the other tourist attractions. You did the island. Um, I know you, Kyle, you said you were there briefly. John, you stopped in probably to ride the parrot coaster or whatever it was at this point. Yep. Um, and then Nick, you, um, you happen to catch the construction of the dynamic attractions flying theater. Um, how was that coming along? Um, it looks pretty good so far. They've added a lot since we were there in October. Um, it still looks like it has a couple more months of work to do, which is funny because there's already coupons available for it. <laughs> the state take flight in summer. Well, I guess it's going to be called Skyfly. Um, but yeah, it looks like it's going to be a pretty good attraction. I can't wait to try it. Got it. And the uh, the other thing I want to touch on, Nick, you, um, you visited Rowdy Bear Ridge. Uh, they've got yep. two... Um, Okay, I'm I'm looking at this on the run ground. They've got one pretty unique attraction that I could, you know, classify as a coaster, which is their laser gun coaster. And they've got this yeah. other thing they're calling now, which is like a go-kart power coaster that I have seen the videos and I don't think this is a coaster, but um what are your thoughts on Rowdy Bear Ridge? The first thing I have to say is it's expensive. <laughs> so, we we did both of those attractions my son and I. Um with taxes, it was sixty dollars, so oh basically gosh. fifteen dollars per person per ride. And the main, the main problem with that too is the lengths of the rides are so short. Like it's it's one thing if you paid that much to go on one of the alpine coasters in the area, because most of those are like seven to ten minutes long, where you have like a nice ride up the mountain and lots of views. But both of these rides are like two minutes long, if that. And uh, there's actually going to be a, I put some POV video up on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to watch us ride them, like they're, they're both fun, fun rides, but for the amount of like the cost per time or the cost per length is not worth it compared to some of the other attractions in the area. Gotcha. And this, this laser gun coaster, it's kind of like a, a zip line coaster hybrid. Is that right? Oh, uh, no, I think this one is all steel track the whole time. Okay. Because I, because you've been on it too, right, Kyle? Yeah. Kyle, what'd you think? So when we were there last summer, my son and I also got on it, and it was really cool for him because it's a you know high off the ground big coaster, but it's really slow, so he got to enjoy it. It didn't throw him around at all, and he got to shoot at targets, which I thought was a blast. So the the people there were also really nice. So, yeah, the the the, the speed of the, the that laser gun coaster is really slow. So the, the the fun part comes come like the the swinging of the car, and it has to be kind of slow too. So you have time to shoot at the targets. Yeah, and then I believe if they still do it or not, the if you got a certain score, they would give you a free ride on the Rowdy Bear coaster in Gatlinburg. Yep. Yeah, they still do that. Yeah. So that was cool. Nice. But yeah, so they have they have combo tickets now because there's actually they also have um, tubing and axe throwing and like a little playground for kids as well. The the thing I want to talk about, Nick, this go kart on a track, Tomorrowland Indy Speedway, whatever we're calling this this coaster, not a coaster. 
what what was it like? I mean, was it like riding one of those like antique car rides with a uh, the the bar in the middle where you really couldn't control your steering, or was it? Did it feel more like a coaster? Like, what was the uh, what was the general feel on that for you? Um, if you ever been on one of those alpine coasters, um, it felt just like that because it uses essentially the same track, uh, so you can't steer at all. You sit in a little two person car, and then there's a little hand throttle to control your speed. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, the, the speed is controlled. Um, but that's one advantage against the, the Alpine coasters is you can kind of go, you could go up and down hills more. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, it's similar to the Alpine coaster, but I'd say this was a little smoother because it actually runs on like rubber tires instead of like nylon coaster wheels or something like that. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it was pretty zippy. Um, my favorite part, there's a little drop that goes like over a tunnel. So that was pretty fun and lots of little side to side motion. Um, but again, it, like their ride was just too short. I, th- I feel like for that price, you should be able to go around twice or they need to do something to make it more worth their, the value. So I'm, I, I'm excited to see what other installations do with that type of attractions and how to improve it. Maybe if you have two side by side racing or just a longer track length would be cool. Perfect. And John and Kyle, have you guys seen the video of this? Yes. Not yet. Nope. Well, Kyle and Nick, then I'm going to ask you, and John, you're you're safe on this one, so the internet won't get mad at you. Rowdy Bear Mountain is calling this a coaster. Nick, I'll ask you first. Is this a coaster credit? <laughs> Part of me wants to say yes, just to inflate my coaster account. <laughs> but... but... The part of me says no because I don't think it coasts at any point. Kyle, same question. Yeah, I would agree with what Nick said. It seemed like even on the downhill sections, it's kind of throttling your speed as you go, and there's not much coasting on this coaster. Okay. So you heard it here on the Coaster 101 podcast, the not so de facto everything. I know it's on RCDB. We'll, we'll... That's another really episode. Don't. Yes, it really doesn't matter if it's a credit or not. If you have a good time, if you're if yeah. you're willing to spend the money, um, let's say it, it it's matter. fun. It's just expensive for what it is. Okay, that's fair. Uh, like Nick said, we've got videos on our YouTube channel. Uh, we've also got a um, a number of articles mm. about the uh, Kyle, Nick, and John's visits to Dollywood. We've got a lightning rod review with the new track uh, that should be up on the site by the time this airs. John, maybe. Yep. <laughs> okay. And we've got a uh, Mystery Mind track review. Um, there's always really good stuff on our site about Dollywood. As someone on Twitter said during Park Mania, it's one of the two parks we cover the most. And what a coincidence that it was in the finals with Carowinds. And congratulations to Carowinds for winning our Park Mania contest. John, Nick, Kyle, you guys, any final thoughts about Dollywood or the Pigeon Forge? Gatlinburg greater area um, it's a great place to go for a week there is more than enough to do I think to take up a week um, definitely make Dollywood a priority it is worth the trip and is is something that um, everyone needs to experience at least once in their life or a hundred times like I have <laughs> yeah so I've been going to Dollywood in that that area since you know I was very little and that was one of our regular vacation spots. And there's also, there's just so much to do there. Um, every time you go, you can, you know, do something different and not be the same trip. This year we kind of took a different route into the, the Smokies coming in from um, over North of Charlotte through Asheville. And we hit up a few hiking spots that I've never been on before. Saw some really cool waterfalls uh, just outside of Asheville and in Cherokee, North Carolina. Um, some really tall hundred foot waterfalls, which was really cool. And uh, just taking that other route into the Smokies was a whole new trip. And I, we did get to go to the Island. And unfortunately for the, my third trip to the Island, the parrot coaster was not running this time due to rain last year. It was disassembled. Uh, but <laughs> the, I, I will say I, go to the island for Paula Dean's restaurant and it is very, very good. So I highly recommend that. Got it. Well, um, 
you know, if you travel down there when, you know, Kyle brought up the waterfalls, my recommendation would be to not chase them. Um, but that's another, another episode for another day, as John said, uh, Nick, your final thoughts. Um, in addition to all the, the articles you mentioned before, another good one is uh, Kyle made a guide that compares all the Alpine coasters in the region. So uh, be sure to check that one out to see which one uh, is the best for you to ride. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks for your time. I know uh, you guys have me wanting to go to Dollywood and we'll see when that in fact happens. Hopefully it's this year. Um, but if not, maybe next year, we'll see what happens. Um, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Coaster 101 podcast. As always, make sure you're following us on social media. We are at Coaster 101, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, probably other social media platforms that I don't know about that we have accounts on. I think we're big on Pinterest. Um, also, you know, we touched on a couple of times and we'll include the relevant links in the show notes, but we are a website. There are some really good articles written by our team that pop up on a daily, hourly, weekly basis. Uh, so that is coaster101.com. If you're listening to this podcast, uh, make sure you're subscribed wherever you get podcasts, you're rating, you're reviewing, you're telling your friends, you're forcing your friends, um, you're forcing your family, just make sure they listen. So, uh, the listeners continue to go up and people can find us. If you've got any comments, questions, concerns, fan mail or hate mail, or really, really want to tell Kyle that lightning rod is better than thunderhead, hit us with an email at podcast at coaster one Oh one.com. Uh, thanks to past podcast guest Justin Mabry and JM Music Design for our theme music. That's going to do it for this week's episode, and we will talk to you all again next week. See you.